and we're all to have you. You um, may have just been notified. I have started our recording. This program will be recorded today um, in case uh, we have uh, participants who weren't able to join us. We did have registrants from over 20 different states in three foreign countries for today's program. So we are thrilled to have you joining us. Um, before we get started, I have a quick poll from you and let's see here. Um, I'm curious to know what your auction knowledge is. So you should have a question popping up on your screen. On a scale of one to five, how would you rate your knowledge about auctions? I thought this might be helpful for our presenters today. So if you'll take just a minute to answer that question for us. And almost 100% participation. You guys are going for gold today on participation <laughs> scores. I appreciate that. I'm just glad this is working. <laughs> All right. So most of our participants have answered. And um, we're reporting mostly an average knowledge, a little maybe of above average knowledge. So I'm going to ask you to kind of keep this in mind as Catherine and Lindsay and Catherine Williamson and um, share their expert knowledge with you today. And we'll check in again at the end. Oh, a couple more people are answering, still riding pretty solid at that average knowledge for us. So um, we'll see how this goes. Thank you for participating with us on that. Um, before we get started today, what I'm going to ask is if you'll make sure your microphone is off, unless you are one of our speakers, of course. And um, we're just going to ask if you have questions to please utilize that chat function. Um, I will be monitoring the chat throughout. If there is something urgent that needs to be asked, just let me know and we'll make sure we get it asked. Otherwise, we're going to save question and answers towards the end. Um, Catherine Halligan and Catherine Williamson and Lindsay Davis have pre uh, prepared about a 45 minute program for us. So there will be time for questions when we get to the end. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, uh, Catherine, uh, Lindsay Davis, who will get us started. And then I think Catherine will take over. So let's get going. Okay, hi everyone. Um, again, I'm Lindsay. I'm the regional representative for Bottoms in Texas, specifically Houston. I'm a fine art appraiser and I've worked in auction houses and with corporate collections since I began my career about 15 years ago. So um, Bonhams is once again thrilled to partner with the Stark Museum of Art and the Cal Sharp Historic Site for our second lecture. Um, the first lecture was such fun and had a great Q&A, so I know this one will meet the mark as well. So don't be shy about asking questions. You can ask them in the chat section now or at the end with the Q&A. And we are very happy to answer those questions and it makes it feel a little more interactive. Um, today, we're going to cover less connoisseurship notions and instead cover a nuts and bolts discussion about how to buy and sell at auction, how we work internally to evaluate your property, ideas for developing your eye and collecting tips, and ideas on how to get the most out of your relationship with auction specialists like Katie and regional representatives like me. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Katherine Williamson. As she said, she's the uh, Vice President and Director of Books and Manuscripts for Bonhams and located in LA. Catherine is experienced Bonhams auctioneer as well, um, and she provides she wanted to provide some information about an upcoming uh, August 27th auction. And we'll also share some thoughts on how clients can bid more effectively, some tips and tricks and comments um, from an auctioneer's perspective from the block. So following Catherine's comments, Katie will give an overview on how to buy at auction and also talk about the process um, that takes place when we evaluate the property authentication considerations and collecting tips. Um, I'll finish with an overview on how to sell at auction um, as well as information on developing relationships with our specialists and regional representatives. So without further ado, uh, Catherine. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and thank you, Katie, for putting the slide up. So the, I'm standing here in our gallery, let me quickly see if I can give a view. And these are highlights from the sale that you see on your screen, the Early West, the collection of Jim and Teresa Earl. We've Set it up here. Let's see, this is sorry, up here. Uh, and then behind me here, of 
full gallery. We're not totally done yet, but we're setting this up. And this collection is a very Texas specific, um, Western American West specific collection. Jim and Teresa Earle lived in, were uh, college professors at College Station for years and years who had a real passion for the American West. And they started collecting in the early 70s, in the early 1970s, it's very much a family affair. There's a, Katie put up a picture of the two daughters who are like seven and nine in this picture, uh, at who are our, our clients today, who talk about how as a family, uh, the Earls would learn about an historical firearm, do the research and then travel together to different parts of the country to meet the sellers and buy the firearm and take it home. What's interesting about the Earls and their firearm collection, we're selling um, their collection next Friday and there are about 265 items in it, only 50 of which are firearms, antique firearms, and the rest, you, uh, I'll, maybe I'll do a view in a better, uh, a better view in a bit, or are art, um, furniture and decorative arts, and then historical manuscripts and photographs. They were very much interested in the full totality of the history of the West. So the firearm is very important, but they would only buy, or fi buy firearms that had perfect documentation where we knew where it was every step of the way. And then to understand that firearm in context, they would seek other items. They would seek letters, they would seek photographs, they would seek other items that complemented in the same way a museum will put together an exhibit that has multi-level of, uh, of kind of property. Katie, do you wanna change the... So on the screen are a few examples of, of the highlights in this sale. And it, at the upper left is, uh, is a Colt. Um, that's Pat Garrett's Colt. That's the gun he used to kill Billy the Kid. And that is the most expensive item in our sale. That's in at two to $3 million. Uh, and it has perfect provenance. It, we know exactly where it's been from the time it killed Billy the Kid to the present, which is what makes it worth um, $2 million. And that was very much for the Earls, that was a high point to collect that one, that gun. But there are other wonderful material in this sale as well. The other, so the way Pat Garrett got the Colt uh, revolver is uh, he, he spent about eight months chasing down Billy the Kid, kind of a all across New Mexico. And he caught him in April of 1881. He, he caught, caught the, the gang, arrested Billy the Kid. Some of the other guys were killed. And the, the other guy had some new, had some new firearms. And, and Pat, this was totally common practice. Pat Garrett said, that's a nice revolver. I'm going to take that one. Same thing with this Winchester rifle. He, he confiscated that at the moment. Somebody told him. At the moment that, um, that that Billy the Kid was arrested in April, so Billy the Kid was arrested, put away, tried, convicted, and then he escaped. And there was so there was a second posse to chase after him. And at that point, that's when he was killed with the uh, revolver um, at the other screen. The watch is a is a presentation watch that the citizens of Lincoln, Nebraska, gave to Pat Garrett to thank him for the work that he had done to capture and, uh, and to kill uh, Billy the Kid. Um, is there another slide, Katie? That's you. Um, oh, that's me. Oh, that's about all. So let me just quickly, um, I'll move, move on and, and, and show you just a few of the other, other items. So in the, let me see what the, you can see this. Um, again, here's, here's our Billy the Kid Here's our Billy the Kid gun. Here's the Winchester that I just showed you. Uh, this is another, up here at top is another gun associated with Billy the Kid. This is what, when he escaped, he stole this gun and he turned around and shot his uh, jailer with it. And then he broke it. That's a dramatic flash. Um, and we have, over here on the wall, we have a whole series, let's see, I'm not doing this very well, of rifles as well. Um, from this collection that we are offering. So it's, um, it's fully available online. The full catalog is available online. You can check it out. Um, there's a lot of terrific Texas related material. They were Texans. Um, there's material from John Wesley Harden, John Selman. There's lots of Texas Rangers. 
Um, it's just a really terrific once in a lifetime collection. And if you are at all interested in this, I, I would recommend that you that you take a look. And, and, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me or call me and ask me about anything you see here. Um, I'll put Catherine's information in the chat. Katie, do you want me to talk about auctioneering? Yeah, could you give us a little bit of perspective from the block? Sure. I, since Katie asked me to do this, I've been thinking about a good analogy for what it's like to auctioneer. I've worked at Bonham since the 90s, and I've been auctioneering since about 1999. And in that time, the, the process has gotten more technical. We certainly use a lot more computers. I used to sit up in the front with just a piece of paper and write things down. And there was a woman next to me on a computer terminal, but I did not use a computer. And now it's very, it's very computerized. Uh, things are coming in from a variety of different um, venues. Um, but, but what is it like? It's, it's most like calling a bingo game, I think, right? If you're calling the bingo game, you're standing at the front of the room, you pull the numbers, right? You call them out. The game begins when you say it begins. It ends when you say it ends and you declare the winner. And then you move on and you play next game. That's what auctioneering is. The auctioneer is running the show. Um, the lot opens, the auctioneer says it's open. The bids go to whomever the auctioneer recognizes and it closes when the auctioneer says, I'm here, there's no more. Um, it's, not, it's not a difficult thing to do. You just have to be able to count and you have to be able to pay attention and not lose track of where things come from, which can happen. Um, and I will tell you when I'm, one secret that I think some people know is that we tend to, we always tend to give preference to people who are in the room. Just like the, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, I see the paddle that comes up right before my face. I see that before I see the phone bidder, before I see somebody on the computer. Um, so if there are, um, so people always ask, what's the best way to bid? The best way to bid is in person at a live auction, if you can. If you can't, really any, uh, the, other, the other methods give you um, a good, a good um, feeling of safety uh, for your bidding. You bid, you can bid by phone, which means you register and then we'll call you during the auction and you will have a basically a proxy bidder in the room who is raising the paddle when you tell them to. You can leave an absentee bid, which means you give an amount to the auction house and you say, bid for me up to this number, but no more. And we will bid for you up to that number and no more. And now today you can, you can bid live on the internet and you have a lot of options um, to, to, um, to, bid through the internet. You can bid through the bottom site. You can bid through our app. You can bid through these aggregators like live auctioneers and invaluable. Um, well, and, and I'll get into that as well, Catherine. Is there any other kind of like, I don't know, tips about, um, you talked about in-person bidding being the best way to get your attention. Um, should we get, is it, do you encourage bidding early rather than waiting until the last moment? Is that helpful to the auctioneer? Um, it's always, yes, uh, bids that come in late can be missed. If the auctioneer hammers down a bid, it's over. I mean, the auctioneer has the option to open it back up, but you always want to be, uh, to make yourself known. If you're in the room, uh, I look around, and if I see somebody kind of making a move to raise a paddle, I'll wait and say, are you bidding, right? If, uh, if I see somebody who bid on something just like this or just looks engaged or is, is making eye contact with me, then I know I should check back with that person before I close. It doesn't, once you're in the room, I see that I'm having trouble with the quality of my, of my feed, I'm so sorry. Uh, but if you're in the room and you can make eye contact with the auctioneer, your bid will, will be recognized. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Just cognizant of time, I think um, maybe we'll go on to the next phase of this, but I really appreciate your comments and thank you for showing us the preview as well. That was a treat. You're welcome. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine.
I'm going to share my screen again. Can everybody see that? Okay. So I'm Katie Halligan again. I'm back, back for more here. Getting into now buying at auction, kind of building on what Catherine was saying. Um, so there's you know a couple of um, ways, to, or starting with buying for auction. Um, first of all, you want to know who you're buying from, obviously. So firstly, it's really important to know that you want to know if you're buying from um, you know who you're trusting to buy to pick to um, believe what they're selling and then what the process is like. So do the auction specialists like myself and Catherine heading the sale have knowledge and experience? Um, does the auction house have a good reputation for presenting honest and accurate information? Um, are they transparent and clear on you know, conditions of sale, the property listings, um, any costs that might be involved for you? So certainly at Bonhams, we're striving to do and uh, do all of those things. Um, our company has a wide variety of specialized sales internationally, but in the US, we have sales in New York and Los Angeles. And most sale categories, like my Western art sale or Catherine's Books and Manuscripts sale have two or three regularly, regularly scheduled auctions a year. And there are various owner sales, meaning that multiple owners would consign say one or two pieces to the sale. And then once in a while we get a great collection like the Early West collection and that's a single owner sale added to our sale calendar. Uh, as this slide indicates, um, Bonhams and most of our fellow auction houses produce both printed and digital catalogs. So you see on the screen on the right, um, the ca catalog cover for the Earl collection. And on the center and left, the catalog covers for my recent Western sales that took place in the beginning of August. The center is, uh, is the cover of the various owner sale, and then the cover um, uh, with the uh, cows on the left is um, Portrait of the West, the Diane and Sam Stewart collection, which was a wonderful single owner sale that we had the pleasure of presenting. Um, so here they are obviously the first logic catalogs are the logical first step um, to know what's going to be offered in the auction. Catalogs are uh, listed in lot order. A lot could constitute a paint, single painting or a sculpture. It could be a collection of, say, seven etchings. It could be a collection of, say, 12 volumes of books, or it could even be a, sur a sterling sil silver service that has dozens of pieces in it. So in this screen, you see I took some screenshots from our Earl digital catalog on bonhams.com. And in the close-up uh, shot, you'll see in the center, lot 158, the Dalton Gang, that's a single lot that is comprised of a collection of photographs. So a lot can mean, you know, one thing or dozens and dozens of things. Typically, and certainly at Bonhams, um, lots are listed with a full description of the property, including dimensions, um, any sort of uh, history of ownership or provenance, exhibition history, and also any sort of inscriptions that are on the piece from the artist's hand or, you know, another, another hand identified as such. And there's also sometimes a scholarly note in the catalog that you see here. Um, I usually include notes for one of three reasons. Either the uh, value of the piece warrants some extra attention, or there might be something really compelling and interesting about either the piece itself or even the history of ownership with it. Or the third reason would be a more obscure artist like we see here. So Mary Mendelhall Gray was not an artist I was familiar with. Um, this was part of the Stewart collection. And she spent some time in Taos and some time in Denver, but there's not a whole lot known about her. Um, but this is just an absolutely beautiful portrait of a, a Native American mother and child painted in 1926. So you'll see that I've added a small note of the scant biographical information I could find on the artist. So if after you've um, perused online or printed catalogs and some things are of interest to you, the next logical step is to find out whatever additional information we might have about something. We certainly try to put in whatever information we know in terms of the physical description or the history of the piece in the catalog itself, but we're always happy to have a conversation that's more maybe a little bit subjective and nuanced about how we feel about the piece or how it fits into the artist's work overall. And then, of course, the one thing we do not include in the catalog is the condition report. So um, each lot is reviewed for condition by the, uh, the department specialists and also sometimes catalogers as well. And they're always available upon request. Um, of course, keep in mind, the specialists like myself, we're not trained conservators by any stretch of the imagination, but we are experienced in being able to identify condition issues. And then we do that in our condition reports. So for oil paintings, as you see on the screen, um, we're looking at the physical attributes of the painting in daylight. So looking for any issues like cracking or craculore. 
um, paint shrinkage, uh, tears or punctures or wear to the edges of the canvas. Um, any structural issues with the board that it might be painted on or a, a stretcher. Um, and you can see in this slide, uh, this is also from the Stuart Collection, a Berger Sanzen painting, a Swedish born uh, Kansas painter. And this is a 1920s landscape. And you can see in my close up shots, I hope you can anyway, that throughout the entire uh, canvas surface, there was um, a consistent craculore or cracking pattern. And that is fairly consistent with an unrestored Berger Sanzen from this period simply because he was using very thick impasto. Um, and so you often see that there's a cracking issue with it. So in our, uh, we've identified that in our condition report and um, the purchaser of this piece in the sale immediately didn't even take it. They immediately had it sent to a conservator. I don't know what the exact plan of action is for it, but I suspect they may line it. And in my prior experience with restored um, Berger Sanzens like this, the lining or even some work from the front can mitigate the, um, this, it will stabilize and then mitigate the look of the cracks by like 75%. So this will be beautiful once it's restored. We also examine um, oil paintings under UV light, looking for any retouch or reworkings by a conservator. Um, under UV light, the newer paint fluoresces at a different rate than the original pigment. And so under the uh, UV light, you can see that the spots pop in a way that you're not meant to see them with the naked eye. So in this piece, we have a Henrietta Shore also from the Stuart collection, but it had a real nice, nice obvious <laughs> condition problems to show you. So you'll see in my right hand pictures, um, the two shots from the foreground. So all of those darker purple dashes and dots that you see and those two slides, those are all areas where the restorer has gone in and touched up. Um, this is a really interesting transitional piece for this um, a California woman modernist painter. You see that upper third of the canvas is so different from the, the foreground. So the upper third is much more typical of her work, kind of a, this amorphous sort of a beautifully um, uh, rendered kind of modernist hills. And then you have this really charming Mexican village in the foreground. So I have a feeling she was, this was an experimental piece for a subject, but maybe also how she's laying the paint on. And it didn't stand the test of time so well. So some of the white pigments in particular sustained a lot of cracking and also some flaking and losses. So that's what you see here. So we've identified all of this in the condition report you can see on the left. And also um, when you receive the condition report, we add these photographs in just for you know, so you can see it if you're not able to uh, condition it in person. For works on paper, uh, we're looking for the condition of the paper itself. So are there tears, nibbles, or losses to the edges, um, waves or, or uh, ripples to the paper? Um, is there toning or staining, boxing, which are mold spores that develop on the surface sometimes? Um, and then also is a, or is there, and if it's color, not in this case, but if it's a color, if there's any color fading or light, light striking from, from being too, in too much light. Um, so, and then we also wanna know, is the paper loose? Is it laid down, which we hope, hope to not see? Um, is it taped or glued to a mat? Um, or is it tipped into corners like you would do in your photo album? So in the, in the piece that we're seeing on this slide, this is a Bill Gallings really charming etching called Fly Time that was offered in our various owner sale. And it's in pretty good condition, pretty original um, to, to when it was executed. So you can clearly see that there's a little bit of rippling to the paper. The main thing to note obviously is the discolored glue that's along the upper margin. And um, in the upper right slide, you can see that there, it has additionally been uh, taped with archival paper tape to that front mat. And then the lower right has a brown tip on the corner, which I think was um, to, to enhance uh, like a, a loss or a break in that corner. So really not bad overall for an etching of this period. And um, I, I think I forgot to say the few prices. I know people like to know the prices. So this was in at 1,000 to 1,500 and it sold well for about 4,400 in the sale. One more work on paper to mention. This is a Boreen that was in the same auction. Uh, really, really strong colors. I love, he, you don't often see him do this foreground with the wildflowers and a very crisply painted center figure. Um, you can see though, I hope above the figure's head, there's a crease in the paper. And uh, there's a couple more slides here as well as a little bit of matte burn from that original mat. And then in this, uh, you can see as well, it's been taped to the front mat and along the upper left and right sides and uh, clearly was in a non-archival environment with a corrugated cardboard backing that you see on that slide as well. So again, colors are great. 
um, a, a paper restorer could definitely um, lessen that crease and then it, of course needs to be put into um, archival environment and you know it will be great. Again, really nice price for this one because it was a particularly good example of his work. Seven to 9,000 estimates sold for about 17 with the buyer's premium. No slide for this, but with bronzes, we're looking for cracks. We're looking for pitting, especially if it's an outdoor bronze, um, rubbing or uneven patina to the surface. And then also any sort of missing parts or a, a you know, maybe it's a, I have a rhinoceros later in the sale, his tusk was cracked and then repaired. Um, I saw a piece yesterday and I couldn't figure out what the Native American figure was holding. And it was because he was holding a pipe, but the end of the pipe was missing. <laughs> So if you just, you're looking for that sort of thing and comps are very helpful, helpful in that. So I can't really emphasize enough how important it is to know your, the condition of the pieces you're buying, whether you're buying from us at Bonhams or your local auction house or a gallery. Um, you know, condition obviously has long-term impacts on um, investment potential. So it's really just important to know going, going in with your eyes open, what you're getting into and you know what can be um, bettered and what you're gonna just have to deal with. So each cat category of sale has public previews, as Catherine mentioned, you know, the Earl preview is about to open. Um, so we have, uh, you can, if you're able to get to our, our locations, you can preview in person. All the things that we're providing to you in the condition report, you can see with your own eyes, we can blacklight things, you can look at the backs of things, talk to the specialists on hand, so we're always available for that. So now if you're ready to bid in this theoretical idea, um, you'd want to talk to your specialist, um, regional representative like Lindsay, or even our, a member of our client services department. And you can bid as Catherine previewed for us in a variety of ways. So I won't get too much into it, but obviously in person, as she mentioned, is, is a great way to do it. But if you don't want to be there, can't be there, prefer anonymity. Um, I think telephone bidding is probably my preference for if you can't be there in person, the best way to bid. Um, that is you know, just registering for sale as usual, but then we'll book you with an agent, um, a person like myself, a specialist in the department or another seasoned phone bidder will call you at the start of the sale to let you know, introduce themselves, let you know that they'll be your phone bidder today. They'll then call you again a couple of lots prior to each of the lots you're bidding on. And then as, long, as soon as the auctioneer opens that lot, then they'll be able to walk you through the increments in real time. So um, at auction houses, we have preset increments. All auction houses do, they vary a little bit from house to house, um, but we all have the preset increments available to you in our catalogs and also on our website. So for instance, at Bonhams, if you're bidding with us between $5,000 and $10,000, the bidding increments are by 500. So if I was your telephone bidder um, and we were bidding on lot 10 together, the dialogue would go something like this. Okay, we're opening lot 10. Uh, auctioneers uh, open the bidding at five thousand dollars. We have fifty five hundred, six thousand. Would you like to bid sixty five hundred? Yes. Bidding ours at sixty five hundred. It's against us at seven thousand. Would you like to bid seventy five hundred? Yes. Bidding ours at seventy five hundred, and so on. So you know it's very it's well articulated. You know exactly what you bid, and then what you're asking to bid against. So it's kind of a very clear clear thing. And then just like an insider tip that I found with very seasoned um, telephone bid clients, they often wanna know what's going on. And you can have these really quick conversations where they say, you know, where are the competitive bids coming from? I can say, okay, there's two telephone bidders and there's some bidding on the internet. And then, or there's two guys in the room who seem really aggressive, they've got their paddle just up. <laughs> and so they kind of have a sense of how aggressive they're going to have to bid as well. Not quite as good as being there, but it's a close second. And then you have the online bidding platforms as well. You can see some of their, um, logos on this screen. Um, we of course have our own bidding platforms on bonhams.com and the app, which you see in our little graphics there. And then we also um, host third-party aggregators, live auctioneers and Invaluable is both used for the Western department and then Artsy tends to be used for more contemporary leaning departments. And so those are third-party companies that host us. And um, some people prefer to bid with them. Sometimes if someone's an active bidder on multiple companies, they can put all of their financial information, their pass, one password to remember, or maybe they are just comfortable with that interface and they, will, they can bid with us through live auctioneers, for instance. Um, there is parity at Bonhams, not always with companies, but with Bonhams, we have parity between all of the different platforms with what we charge for our buyer's premium. <laughs> buyer's premium is a commission that we charge for all sales. All companies do do that. Um, it's also plus any applicable sales and local taxes, of course. 
Um, so our premium is 27.5% of the first 12,500 in purchases, and then 25% above that. And then there's a break at 600,000 and then a break at 6 million. But most of my clients in the Western category are looking at that first break from a 2.5% discount from 27.5 down to 25 at the 12,500 break. Uh, all auction houses, as I, as I said, charge a commission. We also actually charge a seller's commission too that Lindsay will get into because the bulk of the proceeds, of course, are going back to the consigner who owned the painting and consigned it to us. Sometimes smaller um, houses, sometimes specialty auctions have different markets and they might have lower commissions than this, but I find generally speaking across the board um, with our competitors, you're gonna find uh, buyer's premiums around 20 to 30%. So if you're successful, um, we send an invoice, payment instructions, we can help you with shipping. Um, our, our regional representatives can be really helpful in this regard to make sure that everything's happening for you in a timely way. And then even if you're not successful um, or not choosing to bid at all, it's not bad to monitor the market that you are, of your interested collecting area. Um, obviously the auction catalog listings can help you see examples of the artist's work for breath and also to develop your eye with what is, what is a good example by, their, by the artist. And then you're obviously seeing with auction fair market values in real time. And if you do purchase from auction or even from galleries, I really suggest keeping records as an, as an important component of your collecting habits. Um, you know, keep, keep an auction catalog or keep, uh, you know, I, I'm just changing the slide. So you can keep like even a, just a quick digital snapshot of, of an auction catalog like I've done here. Um, maybe just the page from the auction catalog, just keep the whole thing. And then any sort of invoices or, or um, provenance paperwork you might receive that. If you are collecting a lot of things, you might consider doing a basic Excel spreadsheet, um, just with the basics, you know, es uh, description estimate, purchase price, where you purchased it, the date of purchase. It's helpful to you, I think, to keep the records, but I will say from experience working with a lot of families, um, not everyone's following your collecting journey like you are, and the next generation will find this, uh, this kind of record keeping incredibly helpful. And I wanna mention too, that your auction house um, specialists and regional reps are always glad to refer you as well. You know, we know a lot of people in the industry. So if, if you need a referral to um, a, you know, a, a conservator, a restorer, uh, maybe a, a sculpture specialist who handles outdoor sculpture um, cleanings for you yearly, transport or insurance companies, we may have contacts for you and we're very glad to share those. And then we also can do in-house appraisals if you need that. We do appraisals for insurance purposes as well as fair market value appraisals for both um, estate planning and estate tax purposes. So as we move forward to, uh, towards selling, um, I'd like to cover one more topic about how we evaluate your art. Um, each auction specialist like myself spends a good portion of our time looking at property. Um, we really don't need much to start. Uh, we make house calls, COVID safe, of course, um, and also we, we can receive uh, visitors at our offices. But short of that, um, we also can receive inquiries via digital um, photographs, texted or even emailed to us. So we really don't need much to start. We need dimensions. Um, with a, a painting, we need, uh, as example here, we just need inside this gold band, we need the, the height and the width. We don't want the frame, we just want the piece itself. And um, if it's a work on paper, we want the site size. So again, the, the, what's inside the matting. And again, we don't want the frame size because we're, we're pricing based on the piece, not how it's framed. And then with a the sculpture, we really just need a height to start. Sculptures are usually multiple, so we can usually find the comp and confirm the size pretty easily. So we're looking for commonality when we're, when we're doing a comparable and figuring out value. We're looking for commonality in size, subject, quality of that subject, period painted, taking into consideration condition issues that we can see maybe, or that you're telling us. And then secondarily, provenance, literature, and exhibition history also is a consideration. Um, so I have three wonderful pieces by John Nieto. The first is here. This is Two Hatch of Kiowa. And these three, as I'll scroll through, were sold recently in our Stewart collection. Um, they were priced how other pieces by the artists sold, but the, one, the wonderful thing about auction is we often have surprises in a good way. So here's the, the first of the three, the full size. And then here's a shot just, just for interest of this beautiful signature. And then the back of the painting where you see his secondary signature date, copyright symbol, and then the title. And all three had a very similar uh, treatment the way they were signed and inscribed. 
Obviously it's from 2014, so you see that beautiful fresh canvas with no condition issues. Here were the other two as well. All were 20 by 16, all from the Stewart collection. And we did price them, as I said, based on how, if this is, these are fairly small for the artist's work. So we priced them conservatively, but based on really how they've been selling at this size. So the first one, two hatchet was in at two to three. Uh, Plains Warrior one at 12 to 1800. And George Armstrong Custer portrait at 1500 to 2000. And they screamed past their estimates. It was pretty exciting to watch. Um, so the Kiowa portrait sold for 10,000. Plains Warrior for um, 11,500. And then the biggest surprise for me, considering that this is a New Mexican, Hispanic, and, and Native artist who focuses mostly on that topic, uh, the George Armstrong Custer piece sold for $14,000, which is a record for a non-Native uh, subject for the artist at any size. So it's really a surprise. And I suspect the way I ordered them, they, they were in this order as I've presented them to you. And I have a feeling the underbidders who were disappointed on missing 100 and then they missed 101, they went crazy with 102. So that's the great thing about auction. With bronzes and various types of prints, um, it's possible to find examples of that same exact form or image because they are multiples, but we still want to consider what the condition of the piece is that we're looking at and also what the edition number might be as well because that can impact it. So here you have um, two different examples of the same form of Cyrus Dallin's 22 inch appeal to the great spirit. On the left, you have the piece that we sold that I talked about in the spring um, in our February auction that's number 12 and came from uh, a pre-1940s family collection. And then we have on the right number 94 that we just sold in August that came from a private veil collection. They both have you know, nice patina, good details. Um, the number 12 we did have cleaned and rewaxed, so it really has that glow, but I think number 94 could get that with some restoration and cleaning as well and rewaxing. Both had uh, reins replaced, both had generally were in good form, no cracking, no pitting, et cetera. But I think that number 12 did um, differentiate the prices. So both were in at 60 to 80,000 estimates. Number 12 brought a little over 100 with premium. And then number 94 recently brought about 82,000 with premium. And it really was a matter of you know, that how, how special it was to have a number 12. Here's just some additional shots of that number 12 again that I couldn't help put in because they're just the most crisp and beautiful inscriptions and the Gorham foundry mark. And even though it did have this, um, this repair, this patch repair on the horse, it still was kind of irresistible at, at, you know, at that number 12. So when we're looking at comparables and market conditions um, at auction, we're generally looking to be on the conservative side. Um, when we price this way because estimates that are too high simply deter bidding, while attractive estimates might um, get a you know, number of people committed to bid. And then once that competition kicks in during the auction, it can drive the price far beyond pre-sale expectations like I showed you on the John Nietos. It doesn't always happen, but it is, it is a, a, a formula that works consistently for us. So auction estimates are estimated with you know, high enough to signal quality while not too high to deter bidding. And it's important to remember that there's no ceiling with auctions. So, you know, if, if the sky's the limit, my, as my husband likes to say, the more wrong I am, because it sold way beyond my estimate, the better I did my job. <laughs> so, um, and lastly, when we're evaluating property, we have to consider and confirm authenticity. Um, aside from, uh, you know, obviously the information provided by, by consigners, our own research, we do rely on the expertise of scholars and, and formal experts as well. Sometimes, there isn't an expert. In fact, you know, quite frankly, in the Western art area, we don't have a lot of experts. Um, and, and so we, we rely more on scholarship instead of formal experts doing formal authentications. But when we do have one, we always vet with a, with a formal expert if we can, if they're still living. Um, even if we know that it's already in the catalog raisonne or the monograph on the artist, we'll still as a courtesy vet with them. And then other times um, we do, if we know that there is an expert and it has not been vetted, we do um, go through that process prior to sale. So each expert or committee of experts has their own requirements and fees that we, we have to follow. So sometimes they want us to ship the piece to them in person. Sometimes they are okay with high resolution digital images and descriptions. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, there's varying fees. It could be maybe like little hundreds to low thousands for the authentication fee. At bottoms, consigners usually cover those fees, but we handle all the logistics and then they're deducted from the proceeds. 
And then, um, you know, formal authentication, of course, is, is essential, particularly if you're having buyers buy sight unseen. So they have that kind of guarantee that they know it's going to be in a forthcoming catalog raisonné, it's already listed, or the scholar who is perhaps not the expert, but they embedded it, and it's about the best we can do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to, to continue the discussion about selling at auction. Oh, wait, pause. I forgot my last slide, Lindsay, sorry. Uh, so this is just a quick aside. This is just to illustrate um, the authenticity and scholarship. So this is a piece that we had in the February sale, this really charming rhino bronze. And you can see what we've done is there's not an expert per se, but there is a doctor in Germany who is preparing a book on the artist. So in that case, we would put in the catalog that um, he did assist us with the cataloging and confirming um, any sort of details of the piece. So then we give uh, you know, a kind assistance comment in the catalog. Thank you. So I am going to, uh, hello again, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and cover the other side of the equation, which is selling at auction. I'm going to go a little quickly through the slides so that we can leave enough time to answer some of the questions that we saw show up in the chat bar. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and enter them in. But um, let's talk selling at auction. Much of what I do is work with you. So um, I work with private individuals, collectors, museums, fiduciaries in order to service your one item or your entire collection. Every day is different um, and every person comes with varying degrees of knowledge about the art world and about their individual collections. So um, I cover the gamut of experience with art in auction houses. So my goal is to make sure that everything is streamlined with your experience and that I can make, um, make everything a little bit easier and liaise the process as we go through evaluation to auction. So as you can see, Katie covered the buyer's pool for any artwork um, is quite savvy. So on the seller side, we must match that with um, information that we gather from the seller in order to solicit it to potential buyers. So a lot of the things that she covered are things that we use in evaluating an artwork for sale. So the next slide shows um, just a little basic about Bonhams. We're an international auction house, which I'm sure you all know, but we have sale rooms all over the world. We have 200 sales per year just in the United States. And we have about 60 different departments globally. Those departments range from antiques all the way to modern and contemporary art. So our um, specialists have a vast knowledge, anything from antiquities, Western art, to Middle Eastern art, jewelry, whiskey, fine motor cars, and then of course books and manuscripts, which you've heard a little about. Um, there are other international auction houses and there are also local and regional auction houses, which can be a real resource if you have an item selling that's from a very specific region or a specific category, or perhaps just a very low price point, but still appropriate for auction. Um, imagine you have an entire home of household contents that have limited commercial value. Those might be better suited for a local auction house or online venue. And conversely, imagine that you've inherited a work or you own a work that has a record of purchase or receipt or some of the more interesting things that Katie outlined um, that we might put in a catalog and is painted by a well-known artist. That's a circumstance where you'd wanna reach out to a well-known auction house as um, a pass-through to make sure that what you have um, isn't something amazing that you might uh, leave money on the table. So I find it useful, you'll see in the next slide, um, to rely on our regional network. We have um, beyond our main sale rooms in New York and Los Angeles, we have regional offices in over 15 locations in the US and Canada. Chances are that there's somebody with local knowledge in the area that you live, so be sure to use them. Um, like me, we all have significant knowledge and experience in auction houses, and we can offer you recommendations beyond just auction estimates. So like Katie said, we have a whole roster of art handlers, art conservators, um, art lawyers even, I've made a recent recommendation for, and other service professionals. So um, when it does come time beyond uh, just some recommendations to review your collection, we can assist you with the first thing, which is gathering estimates and setting the terms for auctions 
and getting you to the end of the process. But first things first, um, in the next slide, you'll see that understanding what you have in the best market, um, <laughs> I'm seeing the comments come through, uh, understanding your artwork's best and highest market is really what you're trying to figure out initially. Um, of course, we can help you determine that. Um, but basically what we're trying to say is what is the best place to sell? Um, say you have a Warhol print and congratulations if you do, that would be an international market. If you have an important piece of jewelry, that's also an international market. Um, if you have a painting that is by an artist that's well known, that could be a number of markets. So you'd want some help figuring out um, where the best place to sell is. Also, a Chinese vase from the 1960s, that could be a number of markets. So seeking advice would be key. Um, when in doubt, just reach out. It doesn't hurt to pass it by those who are in the know. And we'll let you know um, if an auction, an international auction house is the best place or if there's another spot that's more local that could be a better service to you. So after you determine that you're going to reach out to Bonds, wink, wink, um, take a picture of your artwork for paintings. Um, like Catherine said, taking a picture of the overall front of the image in the back are very helpful. Individual images of inscriptions are fantastic. And any receipts that you may have are also very beneficial in helping us determine where to set the value of your artwork. Um, I've had some clients that withhold important information to maybe test our specialists and trust me in the long run, it all shakes out um, and it's better just to be straightforward. If you purchased a work at auction, share the auction result. And if you've purchased a work in the estate sale, that is perfectly fine. Just share that information. It's essential to the evaluation phase. In our next slide, um, I'll show you how to get your evaluation. You can reach out simply to a regional representative or a specialist directly and share imagery, um, or you can upload images if you wanna stay a little, uh, if maybe you're doing it at midnight um, and that's the best time for you to operate, you can just log on to bonhams.com, click on cell tab, super easy and then click submit an item. All you do is upload an image and a brief description. There's always people manning um, that inbox. Um, I man some and then other departments do as well. So you get a response pretty quickly and we will let you know what the next steps, most appropriate next steps are. So the next slide, what happens next if your item is appropriate for auction? You'll receive an estimate range. So that is a low and a high estimate that your specialists believe the item will sell within. As Katie mentioned, they, it is sort of a basis and it could go much higher, but generally that is based on comparables of previous auctions and where that artist market stands today. Um, also, you'll receive a consignment agreement, which is a written document that outlines the terms of the auction. This is where you'll receive an outline of your estimates and you will set your reserve. A reserve is set for each individual piece and it's the minimum amount that you'll accept for your property prior to charges by law. The reserve cannot exceed the low estimate. Um, so if your artwork is estimated between 10 and $15,000, for example, your reserve could not exceed $10,000 below estimate. Typically, auction houses prefer to set the reserve at an increment um, or two below the low estimate just to get the bidding started. And of course, for lower value items, it is quite common to have no reserve. Also, the auction house will retain a seller's commission. And if that, and that is the case with all um, auction houses, but unlike the buyer's, buyer's premium that Katie outlined, it's a, it is not a set amount, it's negotiable. So a standard seller's commission would be 15% um, for the first $20,000 of the hammer price and 10% above $20,000. Um, something to note is that local auction houses often have a higher seller's commission that could range anywhere from 15 to even 30%. Other fees could include insurance fees, photography fees, storage fees, Katie covered authentication fees, um, and buy-in fees. So just so you know, a buy-in fee is a fee that um, 
is charged on an artwork that goes through the auction process, but it does not sell. Um, the auction house does not retain a seller's commission in that circumstance. So it is a lesser percentage that allows the auction house to offset some of their overhead costs for um, going through the auction process. That again is a negotiable term. Just review your contract and dialogue with whomever it is, is your point of contact. So what happens if an artwork doesn't sell at auction? It's very typical for the contract or the consignment agreement to outline that uh, specialists have two weeks to solicit after auction offers. Um, then after that, you would dialogue with your specialist um, about whether or not it warrants re-offering in a future sale or if it's best to return the item. All of that is uh, an interpersonal conversation and there's no, uh, no path forward that isn't off the table. So make sure that you're satisfied with how that proceeds. And in our last two slides, I just wanted to show how we sell the sale. Most of these will look very familiar to you. I'll just focus on digital marketing, which is in the bottom right, that has grown exponentially over the last uh, decade, especially after COVID, and has shown the greatest growth for auction houses, local, medium, and international sizes. Um, we rely on digital marketing um, to produce greater bidder pools and ultimately larger and um, higher overall prices realized. And lastly, now that you can find an auction, your item has been promoted and the auction has taken place, you can expect payment in about 35 days. That's very typical. Some auction houses take longer. And I imagine that local auction houses are amenable to paying sooner as long as the transaction has been completed on the buyer side. For us, we find that 35 days is appropriate and satisfactory with our client base. And then I have just a couple of little uh, tips. Auction houses do not specialize in primary market. So artists should not submit their own artwork for consideration. All estimates are complimentary and do not require that you uh, consign the property. Um, evaluate or um, also the person who is submitting the request for evaluation should be the property owner. If you have more than five items, it is perfectly fine to reach out to somebody directly so that you don't have to upload individual images. Um, that makes it just easier for you. And then also, lastly, something that's a big point is that appraisals and auction valuations are not the same thing. An appraisal document is a formal document and is used mainly for insurance and estate planning purposes, but for many other things. So simply discuss with your specialist what exactly you need this valuation for. So with that, I'm going to speedily conclude and maybe we can get to a couple of questions um, if you all have time. All right, thank you, Lindsay. And I am just turning our screen. Give me just a minute here. There we go. All right, perfect. Well, we do have some questions. I'm adding some spotlights now to um, get our guests here with it. Um, the first question that I saw was Mary wanted to know how an auctioneer, is an auctioneer more likely to get a phone bid before an online bid? She was talking about um, when Catherine mentioned that um, auctioneers are more likely to spot an in-person bidder. How do you, how do we handle that, Catherine? And I'm gonna get you spotlighted up here in just a second. There we go. So um, the question was, what's the order of who gets? So for the question, it was mentioned that the auctioneer is more likely to spot an in-person bidder. Is the auctioneer more likely to get a phone bid before an online bid? So I will say in the last sale, um, I was telephone bidding and I love telephone bidding and I love uh, having a client who's aggressive with me and we can be aggressive together. So I had a couple of really um, strong telephone bidders and what I was finding was they were so fast to bid. I could, I was sitting the, the um, one of the internet aggregators screens was between myself and the auctioneer. And I could see I was bidding faster and I was bidding aggressively with my arm up and saying bidding, bidding. And I was getting the bids way before the internet was. All right, thank you, Catherine. Now I've got a couple of questions from Dan here. He wanted to know how you estimate a sale price. Estimate a, uh, a, a an sale, item sale? The items, item sale price, yes. 
Well, we can't really estimate the end sale price. So we, you know, we make an estimate based on what that artist's work that is comparable has sold for in the past. Um, you know, obviously we can be wrong. We like to be wrong, you know, with it selling way beyond our estimates. Um, I would say, I think that statistically, my department's probably like around 50% of the time pieces sell within estimate. And then there's some sort of break between, you know, 20 to 30 and 20 to 30 on the, uh, above and below. Um, so we're not, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't tell you where it's going to sell, but it's, you know, it's all marketing. It's, you know, using those aggregators to get the, um, the enough eyeballs on the property so we can get competitive bidding and, you know, hoping that um, the conservative estimate stimulates, you know, people's interest in bidding in the first place. And it all kind of comes together in a perfect storm of competition. Absolutely. I've got a couple more questions. As we're answering questions, I am going to launch a program evaluation. There's three short questions. If you'll take time to answer those while we're answering questions. The next question I have is, what happens if the winner of an auction piece gets buyer's remorse? I take that one. Um, I, well, I can say the idea would be that they would get buyer's remorse after they paid and got it home, um, in which case they can reconsign it or sell it. Um, they are obligated when they register to bid in a sale to pay and execute the sales that they participate in. So um, in certain circumstances with higher value pieces, people are vetted before they're allowed to participate in the auction. Um, of course, there are some circumstances where lower value pieces don't complete the sale, in which case, um, typically the consigner has their item re-offered or we offer it to the other people who have been registered or shown interest in that particular piece. So there's lots of ways to back it up, but our client services division has a way of vetting a client before they're actually allowed to bid. Okay. It doesn't happen that often, I have to say. Yeah. that there's full buyer's remorse. You know, they've, they've gone in with their eyes open, hopefully. They've gotten the condition report. They've you know, given it some thought. It's, you know, you've had a couple of weeks of the, you know, from the time of the catalog coming out. So it doesn't happen that often. And usually we can, we can work it out. Dan has another question. I'm going to circle back to that one, though, because I've got some more that are specific about auctions. How do you determine what day of the week an auction is on? I love that question. <laughs> I don't really know. I mean... Years ago, it was traditional. I mean, it was depends on who, who it was. Some some houses were considered. You know, Coeur d'Alene has always been on the weekend. Uh, you know, since as long as I've known it. Um, other auctions were always on a Tuesday. But these days, I think with the digital reach, it, auctions are practically every day. Not Sundays, maybe not Mondays, but Tuesday through Saturday, you're going to have auctions. Right. And then how often do you reject the sell of an item? So I guess this kind of comes to Lindsay's portion. I brought an item to you. What how often are you telling people we're not going to sell this? You know, it, it, it's hard to put a statistic to it, but it's really based this, which is why this lecture is good to know the kind of things that we sell and what our market is, because I can get things that were purchased at, you know, a big box retailer, you know, and that's clearly not appropriate for an international auction house. So if we're talking about um, things that are easy to say no to, uh, after that, after that vetting, easy vetting is done, I'd say, uh, you know, we probably, we accept things, I like to say over $2,500. Um, we don't like individual consignments that are, that are, uh, more uh, affordable, but if they come in a cluster, that's perfectly fine. Um, but really anything that's by a well-known or a listed artist has uh, a good condition, um, that's appropriate. So, but yes, I do, I do get a random watch every once in a while that's been worn for 30 years and was purchased, you know, somewhere normal, I guess is the best way I could say it. And, and they're lovely, but they're they're more appropriate for an online venue. All right. And then the other question that I'm going to circle back to on Dan, Dan asked how prevalent forgery is in the art world. And I know, um, Katie, you delved into this a little bit in our previous Good, Better, Best. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think this is also a great opportunity to have our, our curatorial experts also weigh in on this as well. So I wanted to save that because I felt like this one had 
a lot of meat on it and a lot of opportunities for everyone to kind of chime in. So um, Katie, do you want to start or Davison or Sarah, do you have a, any of you a burning desire to jump right in on this one? I can start, but I want to hear from you guys too. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's, uh, we have to be very, very diligent in, in, you know, what we're seeing and provenance is important, um, but also just, you know, red flags. I had a situation recently where, you know, it was a bronze with a Gorm foundry mark. Well, lo and behold, it was a spurious Gorm foundry mark. So I'm always learning too, you know, so we, we have to be very um, vigilant and diligent. Um, I, I certainly have a community of people who are, are helping, you know, they'll, they'll flag things for me or, um, you know, unofficially, but I'll just say like, hey, can you just run it by them because they know the artist so well? Because again, you know, there's not always an expert per se, um, but it's just, it's something that we're very aware of. Um, I think, you know, we do a lot of consensus of opinion when we're pricing things. So we're getting, you know, multiple specialists on it. We all have different um, experiences and backgrounds and we, we do see things and we reject them with some regularity. Oh, Sarah, I think you're still muted. Yes, um, that's it does happen. Um, there are certain artists, and Frederick Remington is one of them, um, that is um, ha was consistently forged uh, from the, the end of his life on. Um, and some of it is um, misrepresentation, particularly if you're dealing with sculpture, uh, works of art, um, Objects have been made as replicas of Remington sculptures, and they were originally intended that way. But I would often get people say, but it says copyright Frederick Remington on it. Well, yes, um, it does. But that is simply replicated from the original sculpture. Um, so um, the, the uh, comments that Lindsay made about documenting your work, uh, it's very important, not even if you're going to sell it, just for your own information. Um, to know what your object is, know its characteristics, and that will help you understand it. And we have on the Stark Museum of Art website a page called Resources, where we have the same sort of list of things that you should have to document your works of art. And for those in the local audience, that's important too for hurricane documentation. If something happens to your possessions, um, to have somewhere a, a, a list, a photograph of the work of art with the um, characteristics and and to know something about its provenance. Davison? Yeah. yeah, I would I would chime in. Um, yeah, there's far more forgeries out there than 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 I think we would like to admit, quite honestly. Um, you know, speaking of E.I. Kaus, you know, he was so popular during his lifetime that he produced a lot of prints, worked with national print companies, and then of course the Santa Fe Railway calendars were everywhere. And so there are a lot of period facsimiles that were created that weren't necessarily meant to be forgeries, but they were artists who were of the period who were copying, who were the masters of the period. And so we get a lot of these that come across our desks, that come to auction, that come to dealers and their period, everything looks right, but you're like, well, we know where the original painting is. Um, so you really get yeah, buyers. I, I, I do want to caution them, you know, 99% of the time, by the time it gets to an auction house, it's it's been vetted, but there are those that slip through. Um, we're currently creating the Kaus catalog resume, will be a digital catalog resume. So, you know, resources like that are really great. Anywhere you can do research and find out more. Um, I encourage folks to get out to their museums. You know, if, if you're interested in Henry Sharp, then go visit museums that have significant collections. Go to the Stark Museum. Uh, go to the Cal Sharp Historic Site, um, get out and spend time in person with those artists because looking at stuff, you know, online, digitally, even in books is not the same as standing in front of a painting and looking at that brushwork, looking at several pieces by that artist. And I can tell you a good signature means nothing. Um, signatures are real easy to fake. What's difficult to fake is actually an artist, their layering, how they apply the paint how they treat a sky, because generally while artists may evolve during their career, they really have signature techniques that you can return to and say, yeah, that just doesn't look right. Um, so yeah, it's really fun. And it's, you know, I love seeing, uh, for me, seeing the forgeries, facsimiles is fascinating because it, it's an intellectual challenge for us to say, mm, 
to articulate what it is that doesn't feel right. Because sometimes it's just got to be that initial impression where you just go, whoa, that doesn't look right. Why does that not look right? Um, so yeah, very interesting. Um, definitely something I encourage folks, spend the time, do your research, look at the books, but really get in front of the art. That's the best thing you can do. And there's lots of great resources out there. Um, um, if you are interested in the topic of fakes and forgeries, lots of great resources, lots of great books out there. So certainly research those. I know we had talked about one in our interior group um, previously. And Dan, you are so welcome for the answers on that. Um, before we wrap up today, I just want to make sure there are no other questions or Davison or Sarah, if you have items that you'd like to add to this kind of conversation about auctions. Uh, let's, I mean, I, I think you guys did a great job of covering <laughs> a lot of territory. Um, you know, and, and again, just like getting out to the museums, get out and go to the auction houses. There's nothing like being in a live auction, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're all so used to eBay now that, you know, virtual auction is great, but it's not the same as being in the room. It mm -hmm. really is fun to be in the room, see the crowd, talk to folks, and it's a very different experience. And again, you really do want to be in front of that artwork. Um, so there's nothing like actually being at a live auction. And the more you do it, the more seasoned you become as a buyer, as a collector, um, because it really does sharpen your skills, senses, and appreciation for art. All right. Well, Davison, do you want us to wrap us up here? Sure, I would be happy to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, so I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this has been a really fun series. And I got to say, it's been an honor to partner with Bonhams and the Stark Museum of Art. Uh, we could not be with better colleagues and it's been great getting to know everyone through this. Uh, I really hope that we continue this partnership into the future. Um, who knows what yet is to come. And yeah, get out to the auction houses. Um, I encourage folks to uh, visit the Stark Museum of Art in Orange, Texas. And I strongly encourage you, of course, to come visit us in Taos, New Mexico. Um, and uh, yeah, let's keep that legacy of exciting American art alive um, and happy to be a part of, uh, part of this series. So thank you so much, everyone. All right, thank you guys, we appreciate it. And we have more Lunch and Looks coming up at the Stark Museum of Art. Sarah Bain will be highlighting our West is Home is ex exhibit um, in October. And I'm happy to share Davison will be joining us in January to talk uh, more about the Cal Sharp Historic Site and Cal Sin Sharp themselves. So we're, we've got great programs coming up and hopefully we'll be all together again with Bonham soon, all right? Thank you so much, have a great afternoon. Bye.